Welcome. Thank you for joining me and Kate Acuff, the Jack Jewett uh, School Board Representative, for this first electronic town hall. We hope that this is going to prove to be another way that we are able to broaden opportunities for our residents to participate in um, discussions about county issues. Rural or urban, we are all one community. Almar County is a really desirable place to live, and that makes our county a magnet for growth. We're growing at about 1,500 citizens a year. Our quality of life is dependent on many things. For some people, it's our rural areas. For some people, our high quality of education, our clean water, our uh, bike paths, and uh, lack of traffic congestion. And um, so to, produce, to preserve and protect our quality of life, um, residents need to be informed and to be able to help to make the, uh, the best decisions possible. The five-year financial forecast shows that Alamora County, both schools and local government, face significant challenges in providing our, our essential services to our citizens. Um, that impacts our quality of life, delivery of core services, and essentially our long-term future in the county. Tonight, we have a group of panelists that are going to be able to speak to you to the current levels of services how our services are being challenged by demographic trends and changes that are influencing revenues and expenditures. So in the room, <laughs> we have Matt Haas, who's our Assistant Superintendent of, of Schools. We also have uh, Dr. Moran, Superintendent of Schools. We have Steve Sellers, our um, the Elmar County Police Chief, Kathy Walston, Director of Social Services, Dan Eggleston, Fire and Rescue Chief. We have Doug Walker is here, who's a deputy um, county executive. Lee Catlin is here, who of course is the county communications person. And we have Phil Jeremita. Phil is going to be the guru for the questions tonight. So as you type in questions, Phil will be keeping us on track and making sure that those questions are answered. So with that, um, let me just tell you a little bit about how we're going to um, proceed. Each of the panelists will speak for about three to four minutes about their challenges. And then after each panelist speaks, we will take questions. And um, with that, I'm going to kick it off and turn it over to Kate, who's our school board representative. Good evening. Um, as you know, it's budget season, not only for the county, but specifically my interest in the schools. Um, last week, uh, our superintendent of schools, <coughs> Dr. Pam Moran, presented a funding request to the school board. And uh, that triggered a series of school board working meetings that will continue for the next several weeks. Um, but in addition, we are reaching out to the public and we are holding a public hearing on this Thursday night in McIntyre Road, uh, the county office building. Um, both Diane and I value community participation. Uh, last year, when she was new on the Board of Supervisors and I was new on the school board, we held the first town hall at, at Elmo High School. And we held another town hall at Jack Jewett Middle School this fall when we were talking about the five-year projections. But we were really very interested in reaching a broader audience, getting greater input, as well as informing uh, the public more uh, in more detail than they often get on the news station or in their daily progress news report. Uh, so we look forward to your questions tonight. Um, it's in spite of the great recession that happened that began in 2008 and decimated state and local funding, Albemarle County, as Diane has said, has continued to grow. Uh, during this during that period since 2008. We've added 1,000 students to the schools. Uh, and this year alone, we added 311 students, which is looks like an accelerated growth rate. It's about double what we had projected. Mm -hmm. um, this is, of course, put challenges on the funding for schools, because at the same time, we've lost state funding uh, and uh, have had many unfunded mandates, which now Haas will be talking about. But uh, I hope you find this informative, and we look forward to your questions. Our first speaker is Matt Hollis, the uh, Assistant Superintendent of Public 
of the public schools. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. And uh, thanks, Diantha, for inviting me here tonight to be with this esteemed panel. Talk a little bit about our, our community and uh, certainly want to talk a little bit about our school system. If you see me pointing, it's because I'm pointing at uh, Nita Collier and asking her to advance the slides. So there's no other way for me to do that. Um, one of the things that, uh, when Diantha talked about a, a, an excellent community to live in, one of the things that drives that for us is our school system. I think by any measure, whether you look at our graduation rate, our on-time graduation rate, our dropout rate, the students that we have accepted to um, competitive colleges and universities, we have an excellent school system. And so the challenge that we have in, in the economy that uh, we've been handed and the resources that we have is to be able to sustain that excellence. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, then as we move through the evening, if, if anyone has questions, I'd uh, be happy to try to answer those. Uh, so we have really three drivers in our budget this year. One is to maintain our competitive, competitiveness with our market in terms of compensation. It's real important that we compensate teachers and provide the benefits that they need so that we can attract and retain uh, really strong teachers uh, to work in our schools directly with the students. We also want to preserve our high quality services and our community has grown to expect a great service from the school system. One of the aspects of that is our class size and our ability to keep up with the demands of growth. They also appreciate having uh, local community schools. It's another thing we try to maintain through these services, including transportation. And finally, uh, probably the biggest driver is funding student growth in our school system. Um, we happen to be in, a, in a, a, a small group of school systems in Virginia that still sees growth. And uh, so we've got to be able to keep pace with that in terms of uh, matching that with our uh, student needs. So if you advance that. So one of the drivers I talked about was uh, compensation and making sure that uh, we compensate so that we can uh, recruit, uh, retain, and develop our employees. One of the things you'll notice in the, in the slide that you're looking at is that since 2009, any employee in the county, not just a teacher, making $50,000 when they started with us, over time, because of deductions from their pay, uh, flow through for VRS, changes in uh, Social Security, um, and other uh, FICA taxes, is actually at this point taking home less pay, whether you look at it in terms of inflation or in actual dollars uh, this year, than they were at that time. And we've got to be able to make sure that, that we can have our employees uh, held harmless with uh, things like health insurance increases and other uh, mandates on their pay. Next slide. Uh, in terms of our, our excellent portfolio that I talked a little bit about earlier, one of the things uh, that our teachers help us to be able to do is to provide all these services that people have grown to expect and in some ways take for granted uh, with our school system, including visual performing arts, our PE programs at the elementary schools. Next slide. In terms of growth that Kate mentioned earlier, as you can see over time, uh, since 2010 we've grown the size of Jack Jewett Middle School and that growth continues and is projected to continue. Within that growth is a growth in students who are on free reduced lunch and that's used as a federal poverty indicator. Uh, one of the things that makes our school system great is the diversity of needs and strengths. In many ways these students add a lot to that. Uh, to the strengths that we have, but in some ways they also have needs that, that we have to be able to address that are above and beyond regular growth. Next slide. Our ESOL population, or English as a second language population, has grown at twice the rate of our overall growth. Um, what we're looking at is, is an increase in the students with the highest needs even at the high school level. We need to be able to meet that demand. And finally, um, when you take a look at this last slide, what you'll see is that in spite of the fact that we've got increasing demands, increasing mandates from VDOE, Virginia Department of Education, and, and the Commonwealth itself, we've seen an erosion and a decline in state funding. So rather than relying on a diverse set of uh, revenue sources, we're now focusing in on pretty much one at the local level, which is our, our local taxpayer on personal property. So we have a funding gap of $3.1 million. We're being creative. We're looking at different ways to close that. And I think the more information that our taxpayers and stakeholders have, the better. So as you can see, moving forward, uh, do I have the slide on the key hearing dates? Um, these are the ways that you can participate. Uh, as Kate mentioned earlier, though, on January 29th is a public hearing on the school uh, budget. 
And then on the 23rd, the Board of Supervisors public hearing is coming up as well. So thank you very much. Matt, we already have a, uh, a couple of questions. Great. Oh, maybe I have some answers. <laughs> <laughs> the first question is, uh, how do you determine uh, optimum class size? What's the appropriate class size? Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of research around class size and the impact of uh, the teacher-student ratio. I think that a lot of that, though, boils down to what does your community expect? And what our community has grown to expect is the class sizes that we have. For example, our average high school class size right now is, is just over 20 students in terms of a teacher-student ratio. And that places us very competitively when you think about Fairfax County, uh, another big competitor that we have. They're, they're looking at uh, 25.6 students in, in a class. So um, that's what their community works with and accepts. But locally, our, we know that our, what, what our parents are looking for in terms of our teachers' ability to develop relationships with the students, to be able to, to know them really well so they can provide great instruction, but also to uh, motivate the students to uh, attend school and, and participate at a high level. And what a, one other question, what ever happened to the lottery money? Oh, the lottery money. Well, that, that started off as a great promise. Um, and don't even get me started on uh, regressive taxes, but um, the lottery actually started out as a, as a new source of funding for public schools. It was pitched as a way to enhance services, to address um, some of the mandates that were coming out through the standards of quality. But minus the editorial comments, what's happened over time is the lottery money is, is still distributed to schools, but it's in place of funding that's no longer provided by the state. So it doesn't supplement. It doesn't anymore. supplement. It's just, just replacing. It's just replacing funding that's now not provided. And if my memory serves me correctly, just for interest for folks, I think it was for Albemarle County about a million dollars a year. I think that's correct. I think that's what we averaged out at about a million dollars a year. Are there any other questions for me? Uh, not yet. Not at the okay. moment. Okay. We'll go on to our next speaker. That's right. Our next speaker is Colonel Steve Sellers, who's Chief of the of police for Elmore County. Sorry about that, Senator. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Like many police agencies, the Elmore County Police Department bases its staffing on data, which focuses on four basic principles, safety, accountability, workload, and benchmarks. Based on this data, the Elmore County Police Department should have at least 27 more police officers today. And it's operating significantly below required staffing. A shortage of 27 police officers means that some tasks are not being performed and that some tasks are being performed below acceptable levels. As you can see from the staffing benchmark chart, Albemarle County ranks 126 out of 129 in terms of law enforcement staffing in Virginia. By comparison, our neighboring city of Charlottesville ranks 38th. Low staffing makes for an unsafe situation for patrol officers and a slow response time to citizens experiencing critical emergencies. The county's primary urban population center surrounds the city of Charlottesville. And this urban ring, as we call it, is truly a city around a city. The population of the urban ring is greater than the city of Charlottesville, but its level of county police service is only a fraction of what the city provides to its community. In fact, the city generally provides five times more police coverage than the county does in the urban ring. This impacts residents in many, many ways. First, it ham hampers our ability to engage in community policing, which helps to build stronger police-citizen relationships. Second, it deprives the outlying areas of Albemarle County um, the adequate police coverage they need. And third, it results in reactive policing, which is counter to the principles of community policing and problem solving. A right-sized police department supports capacity needs to provide better training for our officers. A right-sized agency also gives officers the time to maintain and establish positive citizen relationships within our many diverse communities. A right-sized police department allows the county to provide police coverage in all our middle schools and to provide resources to combat the growing gang presence in Albemarle County. A right-sized police department allows us to keep up with the increasing workload demands, as you'll hear from many of the um, panelists this evening. 
despite our challenges, there's some positive accomplishments since uh, the move toward geo-policing at the end of 2012. Citizen satisfaction of officers' performance is up 208 percent from, from 2013. Violent crime in 2014 as compared to 2013 is down. Problem-oriented policing activities is growing as staffing improves, and Albemarle County enjoys generally a relatively low crime rate. Albemarle County is extremely lucky to have a police department with world-class employees. However, we can't begin to have a world-class police department until we're properly staffed. 27 police officers would ensure a safer community and a safer workforce. Thank you. Several questions from the, from the public. The first is, uh, how does the uh, crime rate in Elmore County compare with neighboring jurisdictions? Uh, great question. Um, and the uh, best way to describe it is uh, some safer communities of uh, similar jurisdictions with county police departments and county uh, law enforcement services. Arlington County, when I, when I mentioned Arlington County, has a lower crime rate. Or Fairfax County, the most populous county in Virginia, has a lower crime rate. Roanoke County, Green County, Hanover County, and Fauquier counties all have a lower crime rate in Elmore County. The second question is, if you had additional officers, where would you put them? Um, number one priority, that's a great question, in patrol. In patrol is where I put them handling calls for service, handling the increased workload that we're experiencing. The primary objective first is to put them in patrol. And then <clears throat> which, what crime trends keep you up at night? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, well, we're seeing some, uh, some things increase in our community that are, are quite disturbing. Uh, for example, our responses to mental, cri mental crisis or mental illness are up 40.4% uh, since two years ago. It's a continuing, evolving trend, requires specific uh, skills at addressing those trends. Uh, gangs, gangs keep me up at, at night. We have uh, uh, 16 gangs in Elmore County and 183 validated gang members. We believe that number to be really uh, closer to 500. Uh, organized crime uh, in Elmore County keeps me up late at night. Great questions. And one more. All right. <laughs> is there more that residents can do? Uh, apparently, uh, this person has heard of such things as civilian patrols. Things yeah. like other community patrols. Is that something that uh, that uh, is in place in Amar County or could work? Absolutely. We have a number of things in place where citizens can get involved with their police department and get involved with helping out. Auxiliary police force is one. Uh, you can become an auxiliary police officer if you're eligible. Volunteers in police services. We have over 26 volunteers for the police department who provide assistance. Uh, join your local neighborhood watch, community uh, neighborhood watch or safety corps. Um, if you're youth, enjoy, uh, join our police explorer program and get involved. So there's a number of different ways citizens can get involved and help make a difference in our community. And one last one. <laughs> what examples, what's an example of organized crime? When you say organized crime, can you give an example of the kind of activity? Absolutely. Under the, under the surface of uh, Abmore County, just like any jurisdiction in Virginia, there's organized networks of crime working. We have a task force obviously working in the community called JADE, our Drug uh, Enforcement Task Force that uh, we work. That's many of that. Much of that is organized crime. Our gangs are organized crime. We have motorcycle gangs emerging in this region that are organized crime. And then there are more uh, stealth organized crime uh, uh, involved with human trafficking and other violations. So, Thank you, Colonel. You're welcome. Thank you. Now we'd like to hear from Kathy Rolston, who is Director of Social Services. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Diana and Kate, very much. I want to talk a little bit about the changes that we've seen in our workload since 2008, but I would refer the public to the county website and the, specifically the DSS homepage to look at our annual report because that really will show you graphically what the changes have been and what the workload increase has been for the department. 
um, that increase in workload translates into increases for other departments. So there's a ripple effect that happens in the organization. So when the chief of police have increases or fire and rescue or we have increases or schools have increases, that translates into increases for our human resources department, our IT department, our legal department, et cetera. So while you have this representative group up here on the panel, there's a lot of other work in the county that uh, 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 can respond to our workload increases. We've had, uh, since 2008, um, Kate referred to the recession at that time, and that's what's really driven a lot of our workload since that time. We've been understaffed using state standards by about 23 positions each year since 2008. We're working at 163% capacity, and that's really largely related to, aside from the workload and people coming in the office, it's related to mandates that have come down from the federal and state government. All of that translates into increased overtime. Uh, that, that in turn translates into increased sick leave for our staff, turnover. Uh, the stress of that workload is really showing in our department now. So if you really look at what's kind of driving those increases, clearly the economy is still one of the issues that's driving that increase. Another is uh, childhood poverty. That reference that for the schools, and we're certainly seeing that in Alamar County. We rate higher than our peer localities for childhood poverty, uh, except for Henrico. They're the only ones that uh, outdistance us for that. But we've also seen large increases in our uh, minority and Hispanic population in the area of poverty. Uh, Almar County has really seen some growth in that, and that's driving a lot of what we're seeing. Um, in addition, finally, aging. The aging of the population, uh, we see a certain uh, 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 sense of people that are coming into our department that have uh, elders that they're concerned about that is really driving some of that workload. So when you think about what's on the horizon for us, um, uh, a lot of that, if you'll go to slide two now, yes. thanks, um, are continued new state requirements. I mean, we're already anticipating uh, three or four new mandates that are coming down the spring that will add to the workload of the department and the time that's required for some of the things that we have to do. We know that uh, we've got a new Congress in session, and uh, the old Congress is very, very interested in some of our programs and, and having uh, uh, an impact, if you will, on some of our programs. And so we're anticipating some changes there, although we've not seen anything yet, we, we know it's coming. So all of that put together puts us um, at certain risk in the county. So, for example, we're at uh, very high risk for not meeting federal and state standards. Our key performance indicators, we clearly are not meeting a lot of those right now. We're not meeting a lot of our timeliness indicators. And so what that means is that people aren't getting their benefits as timely as they, as they need them, frankly, or they could get them. The other thing that uh, relates to the risk for the county, I think, is our inability to really adequately address safety issues for, for children and our elderly and disabled population. These are folks who are abused and neglected, they've been exploited, and um, uh, had the risk of increased injury up to and including death, in fact. And so there's huge risk for us out there given the workload that we have and the stress on the department. Uh, as others have said, there's some great things going on, there's some very positive things going on in the department, but the message here is that the department is under tremendous stress and that's showing in our key performance indicators as well as our customer service for citizens. Thanks. Number of questions for Kathy, including what, can you be more specific when you say 163% over capacity? I don't know whether they're asking about overtime or how do you fill in, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, well, that means that staff are working double. I mean, they're, they're putting in a whole lot more hours and that's what's related to our overtime. We've had uh, almost a 96% increase in overtime um, just in the last few years. Uh, those are required over time. I mean, those are things that we've got to be demanded for. We can't have waiting lists for most of our services. Um, when, a, when we get a call about a child that's being abused or suspected of abuse, we've got to go out on that. We can't say we'll get to that in six days or we'll get to that next week. Uh, and so that translates into overtime for our staff. The second question is the, uh, the increase in caseloads, is it being driven more by the economy or by changing demographics? Um, I would say, uh, I'm not sure which is first, honestly. I think certainly the economy is still having a dramatic impact. So for example, when you look at the graphic of what the increases have been in our workload, 
Um, you'll see that it has the trajectory has is is leveling off a little bit at this point, so the economy is better in that sense. But what's happened is the caseloads have not dropped dramatically, and so what we're seeing is that people are uh, getting jobs, but they're getting jobs at still very low wages that still qualify them for assistance. Uh, they're getting jobs that uh, are still putting a lot of stressors on families, and that's ending up. Uh, with an increased caseload in child abuse and black foster care and that kind of thing. And finally, someone picked up on your comment about penalties. <coughs> when, when, when you say the county isn't meeting guidelines or isn't meeting uh, mandates, what could that result in? It actually could result in chargebacks, financial chargebacks to the state or to the locality. So yeah. financial chargebacks to the state from the feds uh, and from the state to the local. Um, and so there's potential for that. We haven't experienced that yet. The state certainly understands that uh, local departments are under an awful lot of stress. Um, but they also expect us to meet the guidelines and the standards that are established by the state and federal government. It strikes me listening to the three first three panelists that there's a lot of, or at least some overlap because what is affecting your department, Kathy, mm -hmm. is also playing out in Colonel Sellers' um, police department as well, mm -hmm. it would appear, as well as what Matt is seeing in the school division. Mm -hmm. Could you all just speak a couple of minutes to that? Is there a, it, it, because there's no doubt that nothing is isolated. So a problem here certainly plays out in other departments as well. So um, just to speak to Kathy's comments about you have to respond out for her child who has been abused and neglected, those are types of investigations that we do jointly together. So the same sort of uh, pressures apply. The urbanization of Albemarle County is putting pressures on all of us mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the types of services that we provide. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's having the growth and then it's having, in my mind, it's having the growth, it's having it concentrated in an area, and then it's also the kind of growth. Um, and I can give you an example. In, in past years, the International uh, Refugee Center used to funnel students more into Charlottesville because they had, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, more affordable housing than, than we have had in the past. And what we're seeing now is a flip on that to where we're getting about 80% of it. And so when you look at a school like Albemarle High School, which already has about 1,900 students, uh, a capacity of under 1,800, and then you have um, in one year an addition of 23 students who are what we call newcomers. In other words, they're students that are new to speaking English in the high school level rather than, you know, typically you would think they might be elementary students. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's growth, it's concentrated growth, and it really is a, pe all of our businesses are people business. So whenever you have that growth and you have greater student needs or greater needs in the community, you need more people to work with them and, and high level professional people to do that work. I think another thing that has changed for us is uh, uh, you all referenced the kind of multicultural nature of mm -hmm. what's changing in the community. And so as a public agency, we're really bound by Title VI, uh, the Civil Rights Act. And so that means that uh, we've got to provide more translation services. We've got to translate documents for people to understand. Until they can learn English and become fully assimilated into the community, we still have to provide those services. That takes more time, and it takes more money, uh, frankly, to do that kind of work. I do remember that one of the line items I remember seeing in the school budget mm -hmm. was some extra money for translation. Mm -hmm. There's an interest, which yeah. speaks to what you're talking about that mm -hmm. mandate. It's an interesting phenomenon. The other night at the board meeting, one of the things that uh, Dr. Carlisle talked about, he's our uh, director for ESOL services, even when a student mm -hmm. moves on and has learned English enough to where they can function and succeed in the school, their parents still may know no English. So. Uh, we have to continue to provide translation to, to meet the students' needs to be able to do that. Right. Interesting. So our next panelist is Dan Eggleston, who is our uh, Director of Fire and Rescue. So take it away, Dan. Well, thank you. I think this is a very good uh, topic, and certainly uh, the changes in our community have affected Fire and Rescue. It's, it's basically due to the growth of our community, 
the aging population, which affects us all, and the decline of certain neighborhoods with really the deferment of some of our resource requests from the bad economic time have really put us in a, in a bad situation. It's really affected our ability to provide the basic needs in fire rescue. And I found it's my responsibility to try to paint an accurate picture to everyone, the citizens particularly, about our ability to deliver those services. And I'm concerned that we're going to reach a point, if we continue to defer, that we may not recover from this. So that those changes had me really concerned. Um, it's really created a gap in terms of our ability to deliver those basic services, and I'm afraid that gap is widening. Um, we've done a really good job to recruit and retain volunteers. We've secured grants. We've built community coalitions, all in our effort to um, be extremely beneficial and efficient and good stewards of the taxpayer's money. Um, but uh, what we've found is that some of that much-needed investment over the years, uh, we still remain at the bottom of the list when we compare ourselves to our peer localities, our five peer localities. And in fact, um, for perspective, um, Go back up one, please. Uh, for perspective, our, our fire rescue budget is $3.2 million less than compared with Hanover County, which is a very equal sized county in terms of the county size and the population that we serve. Uh, when we look at some of our basic needs over the next five years, there are three really driving factors that we're looking at. Um, the first is we lack the resources to conduct just the essential in the very bare minimum prevention and mitigation activities. <laughs> Uh, since 2012, we've seen a 50% increase in demand for inspections, which involves the fire prevention folks out there inspecting businesses for fire compliance. And what that means is now we uh, haven't increased our staffing, so we have businesses that go uninspected, which creates a hazard for our community. And we also really lack the resources to engage with uh, our most vulnerable population. And uh, our civilian fire deaths over the years have really increased to the level that we're very concerned. In fact, it's twice the average of the state average, and we're very concerned about that. Um, number two, the firefighting remains a very high-risk endeavor. And we do a good job of training our folks when they come in the door, but there's an obligation to provide continuing education to keep them safe every day when they're providing the services. And we just don't lack the resource or have the resources to continue that. And that affects us in a very unusual way that you might not be aware of. Uh, we have about 60% turnover in volunteer chiefs out there, given their time for their community. And that's created a strain on our system. Um, it's a very tough job, and this is not unusual to have this much turnover, but that means we need to train the next person to take over that role, and we just, we just don't have the resources to do that. Uh, to provide our leadership training and the basic needs for our people, even to just uh, continue with that um, education that's needed to provide that basic level of service. We've had to defer those over the years, and I'm really concerned that if we continue with that, we'll see some symptoms. Uh, and then our number three um, um, and most significant driving factor in the five-year plan is our Pantops Fire Rescue Station. This station has been in our COP plan for about 20 years. Uh, it's been a, uh, reaffirmed by the board on a number of occasions and even reaffirmed by independent analysis. What has me concerned about that is this is an area that's a highly densely populated area of the county and the highest risk because of the aging population in this area. So what you see before you is a hotspot map created by fire rescue and GDS staff. And you can tell that they have a very dark red area over that Pantop station. And we rely on outlying stations to cover this Pantops area, um, which is it's just unacceptable. We have long response times <clears> into <throat> the most densely populated and the highest risk areas. So it's counter to what strategy we have in terms of our land use. We've got rural stations responding into urban areas. So we're really trying to push to have this station in place by 2018, or I'm afraid that we're going to start to see some symptoms with that lack of deferment. So um, you know, that's about it from fire rescue. Very short and concise, but uh, the essence is, is we need to continue to invest in fire rescue in order to maintain our services. A number of questions for the chief, including what is the ratio of volunteers to paid staff, and, and what should it be? Well, we have about 600 volunteers on various roles and 110 career staff. Uh, and that's a very high ratio compared with some of our peer localities. We have more volunteers as compared to places like Hanover or Chesterfield. Uh, and that thing is because we've invested in our volunteers, uh, but we need to continue to make that investment. They give their time, but volunteers are free. 
interest, and are there activities you have had to defer because of the budget? Absolutely. One of the biggest activities that I've had to defer is our prevention activities, going out, engaging with the most vulnerable population to promote fire prevention and safety at the home. That's where we're going to make our biggest difference. We've had to defer that. And leads into the next question, which is having to do with home fire alarms. Are you still giving them away? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that $10 device is your best chance to survival in a home fire. And we have a very active program now that we, we hand them out for free. We'll even come out and install them in your home. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is just give us a call and we'll be out there as soon as possible. Great. We're back to Matt. We have a question on, the, on VRS, which is the Virginia Retirement System. And uh, the question is, why is the county or why is the school division being punished? by VRS contributions when they had nothing to do with the problem? Well, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, well, it, it, I guess it's like a lot of things in, uh, in terms of looking at things from the state level over the years. Uh, you know, VRS system is a, a good system in quite some time to perform very well in terms of investments. As a result, I think, um, for several years, the, the legislature saw it as a as sort of a cash cow to use for other projects, and then now, uh, what we're finding is it hasn't kept pace with uh, growth in retirements. Uh, it hasn't kept pace with the demands and the needs for it, and the only way to fund it uh, is through the localities. And again, it comes back down to what I'd said earlier that at one time you had a, ver a diverse spread of different kinds of revenues to, to handle the needs, uh, whether across the state or locally, but now it all comes back down to uh, the taxpayer at the locality uh, funding these mandates. Back to fire and rescue. <laughs> what improvements have been made with the recent addition of fire station in the North Ridge area? Uh, we've made great improvements, not only in the North Ridge area, but the Ivy area it has uh, dramatically cut response times for both fire and EMS. So we went from response times well above 10 minutes down to closer to five minutes in those areas surrounding those fire stations. Uh, we've also increased the ambulances in those areas too, so you should see a faster response in terms of EMS because it goes back to that, uh, what I mentioned kind of when I first started, the aging population has really increased our workload in terms of EMS. That's our probably the biggest driving factor. To the other end of the age spectrum, a question for Kathy Rolston about preschool. What, what are the prospects for expanding the program in the near future? Um, <clears throat> well, considering that the county is really unable to meet their core services for safety, public safety, um, educational needs that they have, um, preschool becomes one of those things that um, gets further down on the list, I fear. Uh, yet, at the same time, we all know, data tells us, studies tell us over and over again that investment in preschool is what will help drive changes in all of our organizations in the future. So it really helps children get not only a head start in school, but also uh, it shows that kids that get good quality preschool programs also graduate from school. They um, go on to post-secondary education. They get jobs. They retain jobs. Uh, they do all the things that we need to do to have uh, an invested workforce in our community. And so it's a wise investment, but I, I fear that it is an investment that we're slowly not able to afford uh, in our community. And a question about the, t yeah, I don't know if there's such a thing as a typical social services case, but how much, how much money is invested in a, in, a, in a case, in an average case, and how long can they last? I, I, I guess it's hard yeah, to tell. Yeah, it so is many kind of hard things. to tell because it, it's, it, it varies so much. So a Medicaid case uh, with an elderly person that's in a nursing home, very high cost uh, and the highest cost. A uh, Medicaid case that is a prevention service uh, for a child, very low cost uh, by and large. Um, if you look at services that are provided to our highest risk kids in the community uh, through the Comprehensive Service Act, um, mm -hmm. if, if you've got a child in a residential facility because of pretty significant emotional and behavioral needs, uh, it can run anywhere in the $100,000 to $200,000 range a year uh, for just one child. And so, 
Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, our prevention programs, our family support program, and our Bright Stars program in the county schools uh, have very low cost for the kind of return on investment that we get on those cases. So it really does vary by case, uh, and um, um, and particularly in the benefit programs, it really varies widely by case. And can a case take can a case take years? The single case? Well, it can. I mean, so if you think about um, someone who's very poor and elderly, um, and they receive Medicaid services, they can receive those until they die. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, uh, people that receive um, the supplemental nutrition program, which used to be called food stamps, generally are on it for a shorter period of time um, mm -hmm. because it's really very income driven, and once they oh. get jobs that pay enough, then they can go off the food stamps. And so, again, it can vary um, from program to program. Back to fire and rescue. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, referred to uh, challenges, retention challenges when it came to leadership, to leadership positions. Do you have a specific program or a leadership development plan? No, we don't. Not one that can be maintained uh, and sustained. Uh, which is very concerning because uh, you have someone who takes on a role, voluntary role at that, to be a volunteer chief officer. We've got to prepare that person to be successful. So we worked very hard. We had we had one year, enough funding for one year, but it, funding ran out, so we had to defer it. So that has me concerned. We need to continue to invest in both our career and volunteer personnel. Um, I had a question about um, redistricting, whether that can be a cost savings. The schools. Well, what we what we do is look across the county, and uh, we rely heavily on Long Range Planning Committee to to look at this. And what what you see across the district is that while we may have um, some capacity in terms of seats, or or we have seats that maybe aren't occupied, uh, they tend to be in in smaller numbers scattered all around the division. So. Uh, it, obviously, in order to really be efficient and to, to save funds, you would want to have all the seats occupied to the maximum capacity at each site. Uh, so if, if you did get that right, you know, if you just went strictly by the numbers, you could save some costs. One of the things I talked about earlier, though, is that we do value community schools. So um, it, you always have to balance those two concerns. One uh, thing you think about is efficiency. The other is your overall effectiveness. Does it make sense to transport, for example, a, a small child uh, for a duration longer than needed if they could uh, have an adequate education or quality education closer to home? Uh, that's, that's one of the things you've really got to take into consideration. Two questions for Colonel Sellers. The first is, uh, how would infrastructure improvements affect crime in your opinion? In other words, would a bypass or expressway be helpful for the police department. Oh, a political question. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm an appointed official. <laughs> um, that's a great question, uh, you know, and, and I get that question from time to time. I think any improvements to the Ryder Road and 29 intersection will uh, most uh, obviously increase safety at that intersection. We can only go up in terms of safety at that intersection, so. Uh, the various proposals that are on the table, including the one that seems to have a lot of traction today, uh, will result in a safer intersection without a doubt. A question about qualifications to be a policeman and how, do, how does Albemarle compare to neighboring jurisdictions in terms of salaries of police? Uh, in Central Virginia, uh, in the Charlottesville area, we, we compare very favorable with our um, peer jurisdictions. Um, when you start getting uh, a little bit further out from our markets in Northern Virginia and uh, the Richmond area, we fall uh, significantly behind. Um, qualifications to become a police officer, first and foremost, if, if you want to join this agency, it has to be in your heart. You have to uh, believe that this is a calling, and, uh, and you have to uh, put others before yourself. Uh, you have to be a person of high integrity. Uh, you have to pass a significant background investigation, a lie detector uh, test, a uh, number of different psychological batteries, physical uh, ability, uh, medical test, uh, written tests, uh, or on a number of oral interviews. It's not easy. Only 3% who apply to this police department actually make it through and become police officers. 
Kathy, can you give an example of a uh, state mandate that drives your budget higher? That I could give you about 10 uh, <laughs> uh, right now, but um, let me uh, let me just give you a couple. One is that, and I, I want to preface this by saying this is not necessarily a bad mandate. It's just that it's a mandate that doesn't come with resources from the state to help us implement it. And so um, we've had a mandate to increase the number of visits for our foster care children and our children who uh, we're monitoring as a high-risk child protective service <laughs> case. Um, pretty dramatic increase in the last two years, and we're about to see another increase in the spring of this year. So um, not only have we uh, gone through one increase, but we're getting ready to go through another increase. Now all of those kids and all those cases need to be visited on a regular basis. We need to put eyes on those kids and those families to make sure they're okay and to make sure the kids are okay and to make sure that we're kind of marching along and meeting the outcomes that we're setting for those families. So not necessarily a bad idea, but adds to the workload. And uh, I unfortunately don't have the uh, math in my head, but I, I remember seeing a figure recently uh, showing what it would take to do those kinds of visits uh, for the cases that we have, it's, it's humanly impossible. Uh, there's no way we could meet the requirements that are set out by the state. Another one is training, and I know <coughs> that Colonel Sellers and, and Dan have talked about, or Steve and Dan have talked about that also. Uh, we've had uh, big requirements or heavy requirements for our child protection and our adult protection staff uh, for hours and hours of training in a year. What happens uh, again, not a bad mandate, but what happens is when I have to send somebody away for training, I've got a vacancy and I've got a capacity issue for trying to cover their caseload and cover the referrals that are coming in the door while I've got somebody else out of training. I don't have the capacity to kind of um, deal with that. Uh, uh, in terms of workload, um, um, and so that creates even further backlogs for us when we have to send people out to training. So those, those are a couple of examples that I can give you, but again, I've got lots. Perhaps Matt could talk a little bit about the mandates and the impact on schools. Well, our, our primary mandates are around, are around standards of quality, uh, which dictate to every school system in Virginia uh, what, what's necessary in terms of staffing, uh, curriculum, uh, the, the materials, and uh, all the needs that are established for each school, which, and, and those again are just another example of something that's good to have in place because it ensures consistency across the Commonwealth, but the funding for that is never kept pace. If they fund it, and for example, for inflation, um, they, fu they fund for inflation at about 25 percent, and that's on top of already not really meeting the, the, the funding that uh, should be in place. It's interesting as well because I've heard Dan and Kathy and Steve talk to the real importance of training mm -hmm. and keeping current and even mandates along those lines. And yet I know for the school division, professional development, which is really exactly what you all are talking about, has been cut to the bare bone over the last few years, Matt. Would you address a little bit about teacher staff development? I think sometimes we forget that our classroom teachers and our educators need training mm -hmm. as well. Well, that's, that's one of the, the things that it, we, we listed in our funding request as a deferred cost that annually we come back uh, and try to put in the budget adequate uh, professional development for our, for the educators in our schools and annually that's one of the things because it's not uh, something I guess you look at as urgent and uh, that gets pushed to the, to the side. I know one of the things that Dr. Moran has tried to do this year to be creative is there, there are two assistant superintendents and so she's frozen one position uh, to use that uh, funding to apply towards staff development um, and then try to uh, cobble together some other resources to be able to make that happen. One thing, it's, it's not really necessarily a bad thing that we do rely more internally for mm -hmm. teachers to, to work with each other's peers to provide staff development. They, we do a lot of that. Uh, we have an, an excellent instructional coaching model, but that's not fully funded. Uh, we're, we're down 10 uh, positions on that. It's never been fully, fully funded. So we, we're always trying to find creative ways to uh, address that need, but at some point, uh, to maintain current uh, 
pedagogy and to keep pace with changes in technology, we need an infusion of either resources that come externally to help us do the work, or we also need to be able to compensate internally the staff that, that handle those needs. Chief Eggleston, uh, <laughs> what was the plan that you had previously that you ran out of the leadership development plan that ran out, ran out of funding? Was it successful? Were you happy with the progress you were making? And, and what can you do in the near future in, in place of that? Well, it, w it was successful, first of all, because we realized there was no program that taught um, <coughs> an officer whether or not there was, a, there was a career officer assigned to a station or a volunteer officer assigned to a station, how to function in a combination volunteer career system. So we pulled all the stakeholders together and developed our own, and it was extremely uh, successful. We brought back retired chiefs to help teach mm -hmm. the program. So that's the kind of investment we need to make in our people to prepare them for leadership roles uh, over time. So that's what we hope to get back to one day. Um, but that initial class was very successful. Colonel Sellers, I thought we might get one, and we have a red light camera question. How do you feel about, are you, do you generate much revenue from that, and, and do you think it's worthwhile? I do believe the photo red light uh, program is worthwhile toward uh, reducing the most serious type of uh, angle crashes that occur at the intersection where it's located. Uh, the revenue uh, stream from the photo red light system has declined since its inception, and that's what we predicted. We, we predicted as behavior changed in the community that uh, violations would go down over time. They have, generally speaking. We're in a, about the $60,000, $65,000 range a year for that. All that money has, since the inception of the program, rolled back into traffic safety programs to improve our highway safety, which I might add is our number one public safety threat in Albemarle County. Mm -hmm. Schools, for that. Uh, <clears throat> how, how will budget deficits affect the curriculum and uh, is more online classes an option uh, or for schools of the future in reducing expenses? Well, intuitively, you might think that if you could if you could provide more classes through uh, an electronic means and you've got a something that students just kind of log into remotely, that you would think that you would need fewer teachers and maybe teachers might not be necessary someday. I know that's been something that's been hanging out there for decades, ever since probably the first. Uh, home computer came about, but the reality is that uh, regardless of whatever the tool is that you're using in the school, you need highly qualified teachers to work with students. Um, in fact, I think that students, while well, experiencing online classes, probably find them more challenging and more rigorous, and in that case, need the support of teachers to be able to, to do that work and to learn and grow. Um, so there's no panacea for, for needing great teachers and to be able to compensate them adequately, and uh, technology is just one more tool to help them do their job. And I guess the first part of the question was, um, in order to close the budget deficit, is there a way to protect the classroom? That's essentially what they're asking. Well, those are, as I talked about earlier, those are the big drivers, funding growth. Uh, we, we have protected the classroom over, I've been in the central office now for six years. I've yet to work in a case where we haven't had to close some sort of gap. And every time we address it, we do preserve our, our class sizes. I know that staffing at the school level, when you take into account all the services that are provided for students, we staff at a, at a 10 to 1 uh, ratio. And that really hasn't changed over the past eight years. Uh, when you look at the central office and other departments, we've gone from uh, just under 5 to 1 ratio to now under 4. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've done everything we can uh, to cut outside the classroom. And, at this point, we're uh, coming back to it again another year, trying to be creative and uh, figure out how to handle it. A Kathy Wilson question. Uh, can a more regional approach work where several counties can share social services resources? Would that be a more efficient way to deliver those services? Yeah, you know, we've uh, studied that about four, maybe five times since I've been at the office. There's been actually uh, task forces and study groups and commissioned by boards and yeah. whatnot that have studied that. And each time, the result has been um, kind of in a nutshell, if the local government doesn't combine, then it's not an efficient or effective savings to combine the mm -hmm. two DSSs. And there's a lot of... Um, 
uh, reasons behind that that you know we can go back to those studies and really look at, but it, it really doesn't save a whole lot of money. But I will say though that we do in this region, and we do it largely with the city of Charlottesville mostly, and that is some great collaborative um, mm -hmm. programs and efforts that are going on. Uh, with the City of Charlottesville Department of Social Services, but we also do it with Greene County Social Services and Louisiana Social Services. And so where we can join forces and create some efficiencies, we do that. One of the things that we're looking at now is can we create any satellite services down in the southern end of the county uh, by combining forces with Savannah and Buckingham Social Services yeah. to do that because um, Scottsdale being, you know, a central point for a lot of people in those in those three counties, there may be opportunity for us to provide some um, efficiencies by joining forces down there together. But and, until the local governments or until the General Assembly decides how they can better organize maybe uh, local governments in the state of Virginia, there's not really much efficiency to be gained by just consolidating departments. We have a follow-up question for Colonel Sellers about patrols. You said you would you would increase uh, patrols, and and the question is: Is there a specific geographic area of the county where that would happen, and what would be the kinds of activities that the patrols would be designed to address? The patrols are the are the <coughs> first face of, of of government, of local government. They're the uh, patrol officers who have the mark cruisers that handle the daily calls for service. Uh, that's the com piece of the department that's uh, the most short staffed. And the answer to your question, which is very good, is yes. We've discovered in the urban ring, in what we call sector one, which is a patrol area, uh, that the calls for service, and that's in and around Stonefield, by the way, that uh, area of service, we need to provide a second patrol area and put two officers in that because the workload is so great. We've also learned that in the south side of the city, uh, actually pretty close to where the police station is, that the calls for service in that area requires a second patrol area and we would provi provide an additional uh, patrol allocation to, to that area. That will improve, that second uh, change would improve uh, police um, response to the southern part of the county significantly. Would you speak just a minute, uh, Steve, to, to um, and I'm going back to the gang issue, and the reason is because when I have town halls and get with groups of residents, that's a concern for folks in the Jewett district and in the urban rain. It's what I hear as a supervisor. Speak a little bit about the importance of a resource officer and where we are with that in our schools as it relates to gangs. Uh, what we found, uh, what we found in this community through our gang assessment, our community assessment, both in the city and the county, is that uh, uh, there's an equal amount of uh, access, knowledge, contact with gangs in the middle schools as in our high schools in this community. And so that tells us that we need to get to, we need to provide some prevention services, uh, some mentoring services, some gang prevention activities in the middle schools. Uh, and it's just as much important to do that through our school resource officers than any other program. All of our school resource officers today are uh, professionally gang trained. Uh, they're professionally uh, trained to deal with gang issues and to uh, help prevent those issues. So it's vitally important that we reach our youth at a younger age than we're doing today in order to uh, prevent the gangs from growing. And maybe I missed it, but we have five middle schools, so one of those middle schools right now has our school resource That's officers. Correct. The other four yeah. do not. That's correct. Those were lost during, those positions were lost right. during the recession. We've been unable to reinstate them. Right. right. And, you know, it looks like we have just a little bit of time left. Do we have any more questions that folks have called in? Well, actually, a question for Matt, but it may apply to others, which is how do you get more money out of the state? Oh, <laughs> Matt, please. <laughs> I have a secret. <laughs> ready? Just count them. Um, yeah. So the, the way to get the more money out of the state is for people to work at the local level and to, to contact their legislature uh, to uh, talk about creative propositions for, um, as I talked about earlier, if we, if we don't
continue to diversify revenue. It all just comes back and lands on the locality. So it's not really, a, in my mind, a question of contacting your legislator and demanding, you know, some sort of change without providing creative solutions. So I think that um, the ma if there is a magic trick, it's everybody contacting their legislator, their representative, talking to them about the needs that we have at the locality, and talk about creative ideas for, for change in those areas. I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah. We're running out of time. I really appreciate everyone that's been here tonight to speak. I would like to thank Brian, Nita, and Becky for the technology support, which has just been great. As you can see, we have real challenges in our community. And somehow or another, we're going to have to all pull together and figure out how we're going to deal with these challenges, not only in this current budget cycle, but in the next budget cycles to come. There's one more question if you oh. want to take it on. Go ahead. It's for almost anyone. One more question. <clears throat> Would you support an increase in the cigarette tax with money, with revenue going to the localities? Anybody want to take that off? Well, I mean, both the Board of Supervisors and the school board have met. We've met with our state representatives, and we have suggested as a county that we have a bigger toolbox of tax, of tax revenue. Uh, Charlottesville can do ta cigarette taxes, lodging taxes, other kinds of taxes, and we're limited to property taxes. And we were told pretty point blank the answer was no, they wouldn't support that. And I think historically, the cities had the taxing, a full range of taxing authority, but counties did it. But we're making the case that now that we're looking, we're sort of bimodal. We're a large rural county, but 53% of our population is in the urban ring. And in fact, our population concentration in the urban ring is greater than that is Charlottesville City. And it makes no logical sense to give Charlottesville that authority to tax and not permit us to diversify. Because I understand, I write my property tax checks too, and we would all like it distributed more evenly uh, in terms of revenue sources. So you need to contact your, your state representative. He's right. correct. Cities can do lots of things that counties can't do. And right now, Albemarle County has no authority to... That's a state to tax to though, right? Yeah. Virginia's what, 20 cents, and I think in New Jersey it's $2? Two, over $2. $2.30. Two come from New Jersey, buy cigarettes yeah. here. Right. And so the point I'm making is that if they address something like that at the state level, that's a, that's the kind of diversified revenue that they could look for to help spread that around the Commonwealth to address the needs for these mandates. It will have to be the final word. That's the final <laughs> word. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for you know, all the great questions and everybody in the room for coming tonight. Thank you. Smoking 10%. Yeah.